Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Passive Thermal Management Technologies for Power Electronics, sponsored by Advanced Cooling Technologies and Tech Briefs Media Group. I'm Billy Hurley, Associate Editor with Tech Briefs Media Group, and I'll be your moderator today. Our webcast will last approximately 30 minutes, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, you may submit it at any time during the presentation by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. Our presenters will answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Those questions not addressed during the live event will be answered after the webcast. Also, twice during the presentation today, we will present you with a poll question, which we invite you to answer at the appropriate time. In order to view the presentation properly, please disable any pop-up blockers you may have on your browser. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Dennis Pamukchu, new business development specialist at Advanced Cooling Technologies, joined ACT in 2014 as product design engineer in the Custom Products Group. Dennis has served as the technical lead on a variety of programs, successfully providing thermal management solutions to commercial customers. Currently, Dennis is responsible for new business development in territories across the U.S., including major portions of the West, Midwest, and Canada. Also on the line today for our Q&A is Darren Campo, Lead Product Development Engineer at Advanced Cooling Technologies. Darren is Lead Engineer in the Custom Products Group. He works directly with customers to conceptualize, design, and analyze thermal solutions for electronics, medical, temperature calibration, renewable energy, and other technical markets. So now I'd like to hand the webcast over to our first speaker, Dennis Pamukchu. Dennis? Thank you, Billy. So today's presentation is on passive thermal management technologies for the power electronics market. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the common electronical thermal problems uh, prevalent throughout that industry. Uh, next, we're going to discuss the technologies that can be applied to help solve these problems. At the end, we'll provide a brief summary about the benefits of using these technologies and take some questions from the audience. So first, I want to define the power electronics market. Uh, power electronics refer to the technologies behind switching power supplies, power converters, inverters, motors, and drives. The discrete components used within power electronic systems include diodes, MOSFETs, IGBTs, and thyristors. So the trends in the industry in, in, include increased conversion efficiencies, uh, which is good, generally means less waste heat. Um, however, as the package sizes become smaller and they increase the amount of power that they can carry, uh, combine this with harsh operating environments and you now have some thermal, uh, thermal concerns to worry about with, when using these devices. Some common thermal design pitfalls include inefficiently configured heat sinks and or uh, the thought that these solutions must need to use some type of pump liquid system. The consequences to improperly managing the thermal loads generated is that you'll have reduced and or inconsistent performance on these devices and or shortened times of failure. So we're going to start by looking at um, we're going to start by looking at a heat pipe application, but first I want to say a word about traditional heat sinks. Typical heat sinks for thyristor and MOSFET type devices are generally made from some type of metal, uh, whether that's aluminum or copper, magnesium, uh, and they're generally cheap and effective. Uh, however, as we talk about some more challenging thermal environments in which we see these devices and we're trying to increase the power while decreasing size and weight, um, you're going to run into issues uh, using these traditional types of heat sinks. And that's where heat pipes might offer a solution. So first, let's talk about the operating principles of a heat pipe briefly. A uh, heat pipe is a passive two-phase heat transfer device that operates in a closed loop. Heat uh, generated by those components causes a working fluid to vaporize inside the pipe. Uh, that vapor will then flow to a cooler end of the pipe where it's going to condense, giving off its heat. The condensed liquid is then returned to the evaporative region um, by gravity and or capillary forces. Um, essentially, the transport capacity of a heat pipe is a function of a few different items, including the diameter of that heat pipe, the length of the heat pipe, its orientation uh, with respect to gravity, the fluid properties, so the working fluid used, and the wick properties as well. A heat pipe 
acts as a short circuit in the overall thermal resistance network. So in the bottom of this slide, I'm showing you a quick graph of a typical thermal resistance network that's generally the first starting point for thermal engineers when thinking about the thermals of a system. Heat pipes are especially good at moving heat from your source to sink uh, very rapidly with extremely low thermal resistances. Uh, as you can see in the top right image, that's an example of a heat pipe being used to spread heat from the hot side of a TEC. Um, and in the lower right image, um, it's heat pipes that are embedded in conduction plates to spread that heat uh, uniformly throughout the assembly. So as power densities increase, uh, these simple heat sinks are just not sufficient enough to meet the challenging thermal and mechanical goals um, required by the industry. Some of these goals include uh, device temperature uniformity, so not only operating multiple devices in array, but ensuring that those devices are operating at uniform temperature. Thinking with extremely low thermal budgets. Um, as the environments in which these uh, products are found become um, more harsh, um, you're, you're concentrating this heat. Um, so you generally are using fairly warm air um, in some type of air-cooled heat sink. So you have a very low thermal budget from your device to your air. And obviously, size and weight are always concerns. Uh, as we miniaturize everything, um, these two items become even bigger concerns. Uh, and as such, we need to design appropriately. So let's take a look at this uh, short case study. This is a heat sink that was designed to cool three IGBT modules. The design goals for this heat sink is that, or that it needs to operate uh, insensitive to orientation, so it can be any, in any orientation. Um, it needs to effectively dissipate 700 watts of thermal uh, generated from each of these modules, uh, totaling 2,100 uh, total watts of power. There was a goal for the thermal resistance to be uh, lower than a certain value uh, at a given airflow rate of 150 CFM at 50 C. And also, we want to ensure that the device case temperatures are isothermal to within 2 degrees C, uh, where they attach to the actual heat sink. So that's the points A, B, and C, and those need to be within 2 degrees C. Doing some basic analysis, uh, you'll find that this is not achievable with uh, conduction alone. That's where we look to a heat pipe embedded heat sink. So this heat sink is designed to have an aluminum base, and we've embedded in that base copper water heat pipes. Uh, the heat pipes, as mentioned before, are acting as thermal short circuits. Uh, they're spreading that heat uniformly throughout the base um, before it's it's then spread into the uh, uh, folded fin design on the other side and then dissipated to air. Doing some testing, um, as you can see in the, in the right side image here, um, this is that same plate we saw before, but now the darker gray lines indicate the embedded heat pipes. Um, those grooves have been milled out, the heat pipes embedded and solder filled over top to ensure that you still have a smooth surface to which you can mount those IGBTs. On the left side of this page, we'll see that the testing was performed in both flat and inclined orientations, and that their heater blocks were attached to this uh, assembly to simulate those loads. So in summary, um, heat pipes can be used to spread thermal loads generated from point sources on a heat sink uniformly throughout the base of that heat sink. Uh, this reduces your spreading resistances and increases the efficiency of the ultimate rejection method. In this case, we improve the fin efficiencies drastically um, for that folded fin design. You get device temperature uniformity, low thermal resistance with no additional power or noise. And you can see the testing results there show that we did hit our goals. So now I'd like to turn it over to Billy for a short polling question. Thanks, Dennis. Now it's time for our first poll question today. It will appear on your screen now. The question is, who does your company use to resolve critical thermal management issues? And your choices are A, in-house resources, B, external experts, C, a combination of both in-house and external resources, or D, not sure. So you can make your choice by selecting the appropriate button on your screen. Again, who does your company use to resolve critical thermal management issues? 
So as you make your selection, I will hand the presentation back over to Dennis. Dennis? Thanks, Billy. So next, uh, let's take a look at loop thermosiphons. Our electronics are uh, generally being packed densely within uh, larger enclosures, and this is good um, as we're getting all those components into a smaller package uh, that's desired by the industry. Uh, it's beneficial for all that use these. However, this also works to concentrate the thermal energy that now we have to get rid of for these devices to operate properly. When heat pipes cannot move the required amount of power and or the number of heat pipes you'd need is too large or they're constrained by a packaging concern, um, we should take a look at loop thermosiphons uh, to move that amount of power. So a loop thermosiphon is based on, operates on the same principles as does a heat pipe. Uh, heat is input at your evaporative region, um, causing a working fluid to vaporize. In this application, the vapor will flow through an upcomer uh, into your condenser. Uh, your condenser is very similar to a car radiator. Um, again, the heat there is uh, rejected into the airstream. Uh, that vapor is condensed back to a liquid and flows down into the downcomer. So in a loop thermosiphon, the liquid head or fluid inventory in your downcomer is actually used as the passive pump to continue the flow. Transport capacity for a loop thermosiphon is, again, based on the pumping power that's generated from that liquid head, um, rho GH. Uh, the working fluid that's used within the loop, uh, whether that's a refrigerant or an alkali metal of some kind for different types of temperature ranges, and your air side resistances. Systems with up to transport capacities of 12 kilowatts have been developed. So the image in the right just shows the four uh, main components of a loop thermosiphon, uh, your downcomer, which provides the liquid head to your evaporator, uh, where the heat is input, the upcomer, um, where the vapor flows, and your condenser, where that heat is ultimately rejected. Loop thermosiphons are capable of transferring significantly higher power levels uh, from evaporator to condenser than the heat pipe, uh, mainly because in a heat pipe, your vapor flow and liquid return are in the same tube. In a loop thermosiphon, these are segregated to different sides of the assembly. A loop thermosiphon also provides you the ability to have a remotely located condenser. Um, due to their ability to move uh, power larger distances, you can now still have your heat generating components uh, congregated in one location, but you can ha uh, reject that heat at some externally located condenser. Additionally, they can be made utilizing dielectric brakes in the line. So if you have components that are on current or uh, need to separate these from um, other components, uh, it, it's very possible to introduce dielectric brakes in the actual loop itself. Um, we've reduced, generally, loop thermosiphons uh, operate with reduced air side pressure drops uh, due to extremely high fin efficiencies, and that's a function of how the vapor is condensing throughout um, a, a, a condensing assembly similar to a car radiator, so they're generally very efficient. Uh, and, and this is that then these condensers can be made utilizing traditional condenser geometry, so uh, it doesn't all have to be a very custom and or expensive application. So I'd like to throw it back to Billy uh, for our second polling question. Thanks, Dennis. It's time for our second poll question, and it will appear on your screen now. The question is, are you facing any thermal management issues in the next A, 0 to 6 months, B, 6 to 24 months, or C, are you having no immediate issues? So again, you can make your choice by selecting the appropriate button on your screen. The question is, are you facing any thermal management issues in the next zero to six months, six to 24 months, or are you having no immediate issues? So as you make your selection, I will hand the presentation back over to Dennis. Dennis? Thanks, Billy. So now that we've discussed two methods, uh, both heat pipes and loop thermosiphons, for removing heat from discrete components within your power electronic systems. I want to talk about power electronic applications where the goal is not to directly cool one component, um, but rather to cool the environment within which the components and many others may reside. Um, for this, I'm going to look at a technology we call enclosure coolers. 
First, I want to talk briefly about the enclosure cooling market. Um, these industrial enclosures are used to house and protect sensitive electronics in a variety of environments. Um, you might look around your neighborhood and find one sitting outside for the telecommunications industry, um, inside processing facilities for uh, food. Uh, there are many of these cabinets that are housing all their electronics that are used to drive motors and processes. Uh, additionally, the electronics, petrochemical industry, um, and all of these have one thing in common: is that they're they're fairly they need to be fairly ruggedized to survive in those environments. Uh, sometimes the air is corrosive. Sometimes the cleaning procedures are very uh, uh, are need to have that enclosure fully sealed. And as such, uh, most of these enclosures are NEMA rated uh, to provide uh, to keep dust, debris, liquids from getting inside. As a result, however, uh, from insulating from these dust, debris, and liquids, um, they're also insulating and containing that heat within them. So we need some way of now cooling this enclosure that houses all your electronics so that those electronics have a cooler environment to dissipate their heat too. For this, we're going to look at a, uh, two different types of enclosure coolers. Um, the first is a what we call the heat sink cooler. Um, this is a passive sealed enclosure cooler design consisting of two high performance aluminum fin heat sinks bonded to opposite sides of a common mounting plate. So the operating principle here is that the warm air from inside the enclosure is being blown by a fan and impinging on a heat sink internal to that enclosure. On the opposite side, the ambient air is being pulled in by a fan as well and impinging on a, a opposite uh, heat sink on the opposite side. This is where we're facilitating that heat transfer and moving heat from inside the enclosure to outside. Different type of enclosure cooler um, is made and utilizes heat pipes, but the operating principles are essentially the same. Uh, in this design, uh, Heat from inside the enclosure is again blown across a uh, plate fin design. Uh, the fins have heat pipes embedded in them. So on the opposite side, the cold ambient air is blown across a, a mirrored heat sink. Um, the heat pipes are picking up heat from inside the enclosure, transferring it to the external feed and fin heat sink, uh, and dissipating that to the ambient. So to determine the correct size for your enclosure cooler, there are a few things that you need to know. The first is the total amount of heat being generated within your enclosure um, or your Qmax. The next is the maximum allowable temperature inside that enclosure. And the third item is the maximum ambient temperature with, uh, outside the enclosure. So depending on whether you're installing this um, somewhere in Florida or somewhere up north, um, you're going to have different ambient temperature, which is going to affect the delta T. Um, enclosure coolers are sized based on their thermal conductance. So thermal conductance is essentially the total amount of heat generated within the enclosure divided by this delta T value. So to wrap up on enclosure coolers, enclosure coolers allow for efficient heat transfer using forced convection across a heat sink element. Um, they're best used in dirty and or corrosive environments where direct transfer of ambient air into the enclosure would not be allowed or would damage the sensitive electronics inside. They provide consistent cool air to inside the enclosure to facilitate that heat removal. And there are a variety of different models based on your geometry, available geometry, uh, noise constraints, and cooling needs. But now that we've talked about the three different technologies, I just wanted to summarize very briefly um, the benefits of these technologies. Heat pipes, are, um, heat pipes are discrete devices for moving and or spreading heat. Um, we've traditionally made them and embedded them into metallic heat sinks. Loop thermosiphon is used when you have much higher loads of heat to transfer, kilowatt levels, and they're capable of moving that heat long distances. And when you're not trying to manage a discrete device on its own, um, you might consider an enclosure cooler. Um, these are best for system level loads, and in harsh environments, they might be your only option.
So with that, I'd like to thank you for, for joining our webinar. And now I'm going to pass it off to Darren, um, who's going to take some question and answer. Thanks, Dennis. At this time, we'd like to begin our Q&A. And yes, I'd like to welcome Darren Campo, Lead Product Development Engineer at ACT, to the line. Darren, we already have uh, some questions here. And to our attendees, if you have a question, you can submit it still by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. The first question we have here is, does a loop thermosiphon need a wick structure? OK, so uh, no, I guess in short, a, a loop thermosiphon will not need a wick structure as the pressure head of the condensate provides uh, the proper driving force to maintain sustainable operation. Uh, however, we will occasionally use a wick structure locally in the evaporator. And what this does is rather than uh, being used to pump the fluid around, it promotes better vaporization sites on the inner surface of the tube and therefore provides a, a more uniform evaporator temperature for uh, better performance. Over what temperature range can a heat pipe be used? OK, so a heat pipe or a thermosiphon, we can configure it for a, a wide variety of temperature ranges for cryogenic temperatures um, around minus 100 C or so, all the way up to 1100 C. Um, of course, there's, there's always R&D work going on trying to push those limits. Uh, really, the name of the game is to find a compatible uh, working fluid and uh, metallic envelope material combinations. Um, we need to make sure that there won't be any sort of uh, chemical reactions over the lifetime of the product that would create any non-condensable gas that would inhibit the performance. Um, so for most of the standard electronics cooling, uh, you're going with copper and water. Uh, if you're below the freezing point of water, you may use uh, methanol, ammonia, or uh, certain refrigerants. And there you can also use uh, copper, aluminum, uh, or uh, stainless steel as uh, the metallic envelopes. And then for when you're getting into several hundred degrees, you're looking at the alkali metals like liquid sodium, potassium, and cesium. Here's another question. For the enclosure cooler options, when would I use the heat pipe cooler versus the heat sink cooler? So what uh, most of this will boil down to is uh, the form factor of the enclosure. Uh, so you notice that a, a heat pipe cooler takes up a less of a footprint on the, the wall space. However, it has, it's, a, it's a deeper profile, uh, both internally and externally. Uh, the heat sink cooler. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lower profile, as you saw in the slides. Uh, however, it, it does take up a bit more wall space. So more of the mechanical uh, fitment is uh, one of the important considerations. And then as a case-by-case -case basis, uh, there may be um, more of an advantage for a better performance for one or the other, depending on uh, the size of the heat sink and the heat load that you're trying to dissipate. Dan, we have a question here about vapor chambers. Uh, where do these fit in relation to, hit pi uh, to heat pipes and loop thermosiphons? OK. So uh, really, a, a, a heat pipe and a loop thermosiphon can be used as a, as a, I guess a heat pipe can be used as a heat spreader. Uh, and then a loop thermosiphon is really uh, transporting it over much further distances. So that's where it can be more advantageous. Uh, since it does not incur the same sort of uh, penalties that a heat pipe does uh, over moving power over a longer length. A vapor chamber is more of like a heat flux diffuser. So it can take a, 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 a higher heat flux source and then uh, diffuse it over a, the, a, a thin substrate uh, to make it more of a manageable heat load to dissipate. So we're not necessarily uh, transferring a heat load maybe from point A to point B a lot of the times with the vapor chamber. We're just making it uh, more manageable uh, to dissipate with um, the thermal components downstream in the resistance network. We have another question here. Are heat pipes applicable to use or for use in high temperature environments within aerospace applications? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so like I said before, uh, we, we can configure heat pipes uh, to operate in uh, many different temperature ranges. Uh, so as long as we can find a uh, metallic envelope and a working fluid uh, that can operate over um, the given temperature range for that application, uh, we can configure it to um, be, be able to transport the required power as well, either with a single heat pipe or with an array. 
This is question 19. How important is this, uh, the solder selection when embedding the heat pipe into the heat sink? And how does the coefficient of thermal expansion uh, mismatch here play and affect the reliability? Okay, uh, so a lot of times the, uh, the, so the solder we choose may be uh, dependent on um, if it needs to be Rojas compliant, if it needs to be lead free. Uh, typically, the leaded solders do have higher thermal conductivity. Uh, however, typically, your, your bond line between the plate and the heat pipe is thin enough that you don't see as much of a penalty if you have to go to a lead-free solder, such as a business tin, which has a lower conductivity. Uh, typically, for the, for, uh, in terms of uh, thermal expansion, uh, if it's more of an issue for... Um, high heat flux applications, we can make uh, CTE matched um, heat spreader plates, which may, may also match, um, rather than using like an aluminum plate, it may use a, an aluminum nitride, uh, which typically has a coefficient of thermal expansion, which more closely matches uh, the, uh, the chip substrates that we're bonding them to. We have time for one or two more questions here. Uh, let's see if we can get these in. Uh, first, are there curved heat pipes? That's the first part of the question. And then uh, what, can you, uh, what can you say about the long-term reliability of these technologies? OK. Uh, so for that first question, I assume for curved heat pipes, we're talking about uh, different bends. Uh, they're, they're metallic envelopes and tubes, so they do bend very well. Uh, we can also flatten them. A lot of times you're not going to have a straight line path from your heat source uh, to your sink, uh, so you will have to uh, navigate throughout the assembly wherever there's space available. Uh, so we, we can usually, you can usually be pretty flexible with, with how you lay out the heat pipes, just noting, of course, um, that if you're bending them this way and that way and making them go over a larger distance uh, for, for a wicked heat pipe, uh, you might see uh, the power transport capacity go down as you increase that length. Uh, however, for a loop thermosiphon, that, that's not the case. Uh, so the only thing you need to uh, keep in mind there is that you make sure that you're always gravity aided once you uh, condense that fluid in your condenser. And then uh, the, question, the, other, the second part of the question was about uh, reliability. Uh, so that is really just doing a lot of uh, R&D work to determine uh, that you have a good uh, pairing of working fluids and metallic envelopes. Usually this involves uh, running life tests, which uh, will run constantly 24-7, testing different um, material fluid and, and envelope combinations in a lab. Uh, typically, something like copper and water, which is very well understood, it's been used uh, in the electronics industry for decades. Um, it can survive. It will. It will definitely survive um, a longer lifetime, usually than the components that they're trying to cool. Uh, maybe 10 to 20 years um, for for a well-made heat pipe. All right. Thank you very much. That will. We'll end it there. That concludes today's webcast. Again, if we did not get a chance to answer your question today, our sponsors will do their best to address them after today's presentation. Our thanks again to Dennis Pamukchu, Darren Campo, and everyone out there for joining us. And just a reminder, this webcast will be available on demand at www.techbriefs.com for the next 12 months. Have a great day.